her within the thick of it with Sammy Whitehead and I'm really excited because on today we're going to be joined by award-winning filmmaker Jonathan Duffy. <laughs> Hey, you're on Bent TV with Sammy and I'm welcoming Jonathan Duffy. Darling, welcome today. Thank you. Thank you. This is my virgin experience. <laughs> oh, I know. And we're really excited to have you because uh, one of the best things that ever happened with Cam Campbell Newman coming into government was you are a refugee of him. You've had to come down here yes. and enjoy the loveliness of Victoria. Yes, yes. I was smuggled out of Queensland in a barrel of Bundy rum. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about you being an award-winning filmmaker and of course it is about The Doctor's Wife. Well, I just, I adore this movie, darling. Tell us about the journey for this. Okay, um, well this this <laughs> film, it's uh, it follows uh, myself and my partner Vincent, who is, is a doctor, mm. um, as we made the journey moving from Brisbane uh, into a small country community in central Queensland called Mandubra um, as an openly gay couple and what it was like for us uh, to to do that, so um, wow, yeah, we we were noticed, we were understandably probably quite scared about mm. about this impending move because Vincent had a scholarship and had to go to the country, um, and uh, so I took along a camera and filmed everything, and what you have is this film. We hear so much about rural and regional areas being so different from members of our community. How did you find it yourself? Well, we were really, uh, we had a lot of preconceptions about what we thought we would encounter. We thought there'd be like pitchforks and burning torches. <laughs> um, but what we found was uh, a community that, that really took care of its own. Um, and and a place that we we, be, we sort of called home because uh, yeah it it, it was a, a I don't know the, what I discovered about rural communities is what you get out of it is really what you put in. Mm. Um, both Vincent and myself really tried to become part of the community in this town, and that served us incredibly well. So when you're actually doing this, did you sort of find when you first moved there, so it was a little bit of the case of uh, the only gays in the village. Well, we thought we would be, but yes. that's, it's impossible. Like they, there were other gay people. We are but out there. We're, we're everywhere. <laughs> um, but uh, and and what I take from that is when people actually say, um, "I've never met a gay person before," my response to them is that you know of. Yeah, that's right. Uh, th they're everywhere. They really are. They they and working in all kinds of jobs. It's just not as visible. But what we found was, because we were a visible couple within the community, it did sort of enable other people to be more honest with who they were. You know, we, we made friends who did actually come out while we were there. Um, that unfortunately what that stuff- a massive step yeah, for them. I know, but unfortunately that's not in the film because it was out of respect for for that friend. They didn't want their story oh, absolutely. on camera. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I suppose that you do find is, uh, a, as you said, like being a doctor in the community, especially in a, in a rural area, is uh, the doctor has actually, he's quite a, quite a personality in the community. So that would have actually been a lot different for you to be thrown into that. Because I mean, you're a very bright personality yes. yourself, but to sort of be the couple about town. It is actually a lot like suddenly becoming a celebrity overnight mm. um, because the doctor and the doctor's wife uh, their roles and 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 everybody knows who you are it takes an hour to buy milk uh, you know you've got to do things sometimes like put put your wine bottles in cereal boxes when you put them in the bin um, <laughs> just, just so that people don't think you've had a boozer the night before uh, yeah it's it, it was quite an experience um, being in a community where everybody knew what you were doing and in a way watched your every move um, I remember there was one time where one lady asked Vincent at work um, how his uh, bolognese was the night before because a friend of hers had seen the ingredients in my shopping trolley. So wow. <laughs> it was, that's quite, that's very close to, I think, being a new idea, you know, snapped with a coffee and a bad <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it, it was an experience. But the other thing too, I suppose, is it gave you a chance um, to sort of really explore um, a little bit more of your artistic side. And uh, the film has been so well received about town Thank and you. include winning an award. Uh, yes, that was, that was a really that. incredible moment. Um, so I won the Award of Excellence from the Canada International Film Festival, which for me was um, a huge pat on the back, not just because it was an international festival, but because it was a mainstream one. It wasn't purely an LGBT mm. um, film festival. And one thing I have found is that it I, it has been well received, but this film has actually been probably been more well received with the heterosexual community than it has been with the gay and lesbian community. And I think it's because um, I don't know. It speaks about the I guess the the normal 
aspects of our relationship, the fact that Vincent and I are just as boring as, as any other couple. Well, it shows so many people that the fact that we're your neighbours, we're the bank tellers, exactly. we work at the post office, we have the same thing, getting out of bed in the morning, yep. making sure you've got f enough food in the fridge for lunch yep. and dinner that day, getting the kids off to school. Um, and I think that's probably why it's been so well received in the straight community as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's I've, I've had a lot of people give me feedback where they go, um, you know, because I saw your film, I now understand more about, mm. about um, how the same gay and lesbian people are to Yeah, it's us. not just a snapshot into gay life. No, no. No, no, no. There's no sort of drugs and party boys and we no. don't, that doesn't happen every day. Not every day anyway. Not every day. No, 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 no. <laughs> now for you, how does it feel as a filmmaker um, with having having you on DVD and everything and now out in the stores here in yes. Australia to actually walk into one of the shops? You know, I was in the big yellow record store the other day and, and I tweeted a photo to you that I yeah. walked in and went, it's, it's John movie. It it's so exciting. It's, it's kind of dangerous though. I, I, I've only seen it in a shop once. Mm. Um, it's dangerous for me to see it because if I see it, I buy it. <laughs> and they go, oh my God, it's all sold out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's stupid. I buy it in the hopes that they'll get more in. Mm. Um, so that's it, it, a little bit weird and narcissistic, I think, buying your own film. Oh, well, you know. You know. You, <laughs> you, eventually I might make some money out of it. Who knows? Um, but it is. It's, 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 a strange, it's strange to have this tangible object um, that's actually in, it, it's quite old too. You know, I started making it in 2008. Mm. So, and we joke about you sort of being a refugee from the change of government uh, yep. in Queensland, but uh, the reality is, is there has been so many members of our community that just couldn't hack with all of the political changes that were happening up there. So it's also not only you, but there's been many other people that have actually moved away down to become Mexicans. Mexicans south of the border. <laughs> it's nice and spicy down here. Oh well, you know, there's always lots of fun to happen, darling. I just think um, it's just such a great achievement for you, and also great recognition of the amazing work that, that you do as a filmmaker and uh, um, I definitely want to have you back in again shortly and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the amazing work you do including stand up. Thank you very much. You're with Sammy in the thick of it with award winning filmmaker Jonathan Duffy on Bent TV. After the break we'll be meeting Star Lady. She's a transgender hairdresser from Alice Springs. Uh, that's after the break in Deep Trends. Hi, I'm Canon, and this is my co-host Zoe. And we're with our very special guest, Star Lady. Star Lady, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm from the Northern Territory and I work in remote Indigenous communities teaching hairdressing, fashion and beauty. And I work a lot with the uh, Indigenous uh, sister girl, brother boy and Indigenous gay and lesbian community up there. And we've been working together a lot um, promoting their rights and um, working on intercultural activities. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you mean by sister girl and brother boy? Okay. Sister Girl and Brother Boys is uh, it's a cultural identity within itself, but it represents the you know the trans community within Indigenous culture. But it is a very distinct cultural identity. So you can't just go, oh, it's Indigenous trans people, because it's so much more than that. I heard that um, the Sister Girls Brother Boys may not identify as transgender. Is that true? And what do you think is the differences and the connections between um, our trans communities. Okay. I mean, some of it, you know, I'm not an Indigenous sister girl, so, you know, some of, the, some of that question is, you know, is difficult for me to answer. And I'd say there'd be a diverse opinion within, uh, within that community about how they view their own identity. But there is really strong, um, different, you know, cultural you know, identities, you know. I think, you know, some sister girls don't necessarily, you know, it's about culturally, sister girls culturally identifying as a woman. And in some places that comes, like a lot from top end places, comes from a, you know, ancient cultural heritage, while in other pl places it would be perceived as new culture coming in. So that culture, you know, is spreading. And not everybody who, 
um, you know, m mightn't identify with that um, terminology. You know, I'm working with young people, incredibly remote, like I'm talking about thousand kilometres northwest of Alice Springs, you know, in some communities where they haven't even heard that term, you know, sister girls, but you know, they are identified within the community as having a diverse gender. So in terms of people accessing hormones and things, is that an issue for people? Um, I think, you know, for, for you know, Indigenous um, youth, ac you know, who are living remote, I don't think accessing those services um, is the top priority. You know, their top priority is about feeling accepted within their community. I think, you know, with one of the differences between, you know, Indigenous um, sister girl and brother boy culture and trans people in the, in the in the city is, I think, uh, you know, hormones and things and that those options come a lot later, later on, in, which is, you know, similar, but it's not something that young people, I think, uh, you know, young sister girls, uh, that's their immediate needs. Do you think of any ways that the greater trans community can support sister girl, brother boy? Like, communities? Well, well, I know, you know, at least in the Northern Territory, there are no services at all that are dealing with, you know, under 18 transgendered people. And in the greater, you know, even in the greater trend, you know, with, with older trans sister girls and brother boys as well, there is a complete lack of support services except regarding sexual health. And I know that the, the community has a lot more needs in terms of advocacy, um, community outreach, and you know, um, accessing you know um, uh, homeless services and things like that. And so there's a lot more needs. And I know that that community really struggles with racism in in the you know GBLTI um, community. And so we we need to be actively supporting that community and showing and showing them that we're behind them. And that's why our community in Alice Springs recently recently held a um, you know an intercultural pride event, and it was Pride Carnival, and it was the first one in Alice Springs. And we got managed to get that carnival broadcast live on on Karma Radio, which is an Indigenous radio station. And our community, we got behind them. We got behind especially key people within the sister girl and brother boy community to help them be role models and to help their stories get out there. And I think it's a first and I'd like to see the rest of Australia, you know, following suit and the rest of our gay and lesbian and transgender community getting behind them. And you know, they're everywhere, you know, in all the cities we need to get behind, the, um, you know, Indigenous um, GBLTI community and sister girls and brother boys and show them our support. The Pride Carnival that you had in Alice Springs has really put you guys on the map. It's pretty amazing to see the photos and hear the stories that came from that event. Yeah, we were really excited. I mean, if we can do it in Alice Springs, and Alice Springs can be an incredibly segregated community. There can be big divisions between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And if we can make it happen there, I think, you know, we can make it happen anywhere. And I thought we felt as a community, we've got the unique opportunity to address this. And we we're hearing stories from the sister girl and brother boy community about racism they'd been experiencing. Like there were performances in Cairns where, where, you know, drag queens, you know, were mocking, you know, sister girls in a show. And it had a massive impact on the sister girl community. And it was one of the things that, you know, inspired us to go, oh, we want to show them that we actually support them. And they struggle so much in their communities. Like, it's hard. And, you know, that's why I think we need to support them. They're already struggling. Why should we then, you know, discriminate against, you know, against them? We need to support them. So we've kind of been um, meeting on the internet some of these leaders in the sister girl community. It's really nice to start having conversations with, you know, our friends r rurally anywhere. But I don't know, meeting, there's some really amazing leaders within the sister girl community. Someone. I've met Rosalina and I've met Lisa and Brianna. And I haven't met Crystal, but I've heard a lot about Crystal. <laughs> um, yeah, they're really amazing leaders within the um, sister girl and brother boy mm -hmm. community. And they've really um, step, you know, they've been stepping up and getting their stories out there. And we need to be, we need to be consulting with them. How can we help them? How can we support it? Because they're asking for, for that support. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about brother boys. 
do you know come into contact with many or yeah there are bro there are brother boys and it's a different you know there's a different sort of I think they can you know can definitely in remote communities you know it's more more even more hidden than sister girls and so they can really struggle and it's a element that, of the community that we're trying to reach out to more. Um, a little bit earlier we were talking about um, I guess you felt that the communities up in the um, Northern Territory were quite supportive of each other and that wasn't necessarily reflected kind of you know in different cities and different kind of communities outside yeah. of that. Yeah so in the Northern Territory it's such a small part it's small community we don't have time for divisions and so you know sister girls brother boys mm -hmm. trans people gender diverse people we all come together and we all work together and we all support each other and I think it's really sad when I come you know when we come into state and there are so many divisions in the community we're asking for acceptance from the greater community we need to accept each other more and support each other more and that's what I think you know the Northern Territory if anything you know I'd hope that we can share that. Sometimes there is tensions I think in bigger cities with all the politics surrounding gender and sexuality. Thanks for coming. <laughs> ah, thanks for having me. And we look forward to working with you and working with the greater GBLTI community. Coming up on Bent TV tonight, in the thick of it with Sammy Whitehead, I'm going to be joined by two amazing people, dear friends of mine and fabulous advocates for the community, Michelle and Stephen Barber. You're in the thick of it with Sammy and I'm joined by Michelle and Stephen Barber who have back to visit me again to talk some more about some of their amazing work that they do for our community. Welcome back Stephen and Michelle. Thank you. Thanks Sammy, thanks for having us. Now uh, you've just done so much fabulous stuff for the community, um, you know, the list is so massive but uh, <laughs> after you went and saw Ate the Play and uh, then decided to have the production for Midsummer 2013 and mm -hmm. it was just wonderful and as with Eight the Play you need to donate money you were saying mm -hmm. um, and you chose three organisations to donate that money to didn't you Michelle? Yeah we did join only 4.9, the Enough Campaign and Minus 18. And you got yep. to know um, through those organisations very well through Stephen got you an amazing Christmas present didn't he? He did taste a radio <laughs> course at Joy and I uh, did that in uh, February last year. Yep. Yeah so of course now you can catch everyone can catch you regularly on joy with stand up straight and you've met some yes. wonderful people amazing through that mm. and of course you know with the, all the wonderful work that you are doing um, and of course at midsummer this year 2014 you produced an amazing production mm. which is still going the rave reviews are just fabulous yeah. um, status the play and of course a lot of that has come out through you getting to know the enough campaign hasn't it? Yeah um, after uh, Ate the Play uh, Brent Allen from uh, Living Positive and the Enough campaign actually approached us to produce something for uh, AIDS 2014 which is uh, coming up real soon mm. um, and we had some ideas and concepts uh, to put forward but there was nothing concrete we actually tried for, for another play um, but we couldn't get the rights to it and just through serendipitous moments, and that, and that is my absolute favourite word, um, we actually met a uh, very talented Adam Gardner, um, who introduced us to Cameron Menzies, who actually uh, transcribed and created the, the work Which that Which of course is. we ended up with this absolutely fabulous, mm. fabulous play. And, it, and it's really more than a play, isn't it? It's sort mm. of like this collective of conversations and mm. people talking about their history, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it's also not... Um, one of the things that surprised us seeing it up on stage was how moving it was, number one, but also some of the hysterical stories mm. that people had mm -hmm. and hearing the audience laugh at things that perhaps they might not have thought that they should be laughing at. And that was probably one of the big surprises at that. Very moving and emotional as it, we always knew it was going to be. And it's all about, it's pretty much real life stories about um, mm. about living, not only, it's not just about living with HIV um, and the stigma involved with your status, but it's also about the lives of people around you and how they're affected by that, isn't it, Stephen? Absolutely. We, we actually took a whole bunch of uh, 
uh, scenarios. So we want to dis dispel a lot of the myths and rumours about HIV and that stigma attached to it. And we interviewed people who cared for people with HIV. We actually uh, interviewed straight people, parents of gay children. There was a whole range of, of interviewees. Um, and and their the stories have been compiled and created into a dramatic piece uh, with, with the talented work of Cameron Menzies. And how is that for you, Michelle, you know, as, a, as the mum of a gay child, mm. to listen to some of the stories of the parents and how that affected them? Yeah, and it, it's, it's kind of two schools of thought. It's that uh, fear of what could potentially happen, being the mum of a gay son. Mm. And then also, um, it, it kind of gave me more of a purpose around making sure people supported those living with HIV and it, 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 it kind of meant that I became maybe a bit more of an advocate and in making it kind of normalising the conversation, bringing conversation out into spaces that would not p perhaps have normally been we had that discussion. Well, that's right. And see, and I think that's where the Enough campaign and so yeah. many other organisations and a lot of the work that you guys are doing has made this such an important work and it's why it was so incredibly well received mm. in Midsummer, was that a lot of people don't stop and realise that outing somebody's HIV status is as bad and in a lot of cases worse than outing someone's sexuality because you yeah. know it has a similar if not more devastating impact on how their lives are affected by it. Mm. And it's no one else's business, it's not our business or anyone else's no. to tell anybody's story. And, and, and one of the things that we I, I guess has become a common thread for us is starting conversations giving people a, a different way of thinking about a, a subject or, or something, not saying anybody's right or wrong by just giving you something different to think about. And that's one of the things with this. Uh, it, it is quite edgy, I, mm. I, I will say that, but we don't want to lose the fact that this is humanistic. Mm. We are dealing with people's lives and, and we will, you know, people have heard things that aren't general conversation. Mm. Um, and, and I know there's been some mixed responses to it, yeah. but the, we, we, we never want to lose sight that these belong to people. I think one of the things that, you know, I, I was so moved by the production um, and and the so many different voices and the different aspects of it. And, mm. and I remember um, having a conversation with you both as, you know, having a you know a nearly 12 year old son and I take him to a lot of, a lot mm. of stuff um, about, you know, honestly, would you take a 12 year old to see it? And there's no reason why you can't, but it is, it's about real life. So yes. of course there are some very adult um, situations that are actually yeah. faced and talked about and uh, and you know that's what life's about so it's something that that definitely if he had have been 15 or 16 he would have come with mm. me and he would have absolutely enjoyed mm. it because it's a totally different mind space but uh, I loved the fact that it was just so real and I think that's to me is what moved me the most mm. and very intimate it's quite a, it was a small space and it made it very intimate and I think that that's why perhaps people were moved maybe even more so because they were you know, able to feet share away, it. Mm. and it was really close and very very intimate so of course with AIDS 2014 on our doorstep yeah um, <laughs> such an exciting thing so the next step I mean we got to see the world premiere of this amazing mm. collective mm. that's the next step isn't it is being is being able to do it for it, it is S status is actually a work in progress mm. and, and it's one of those things that I, I think the dynamics will change time and time again um, we will in actual fact have a look at um, AIDS 2014 which comes up uh, in July yes. Um, yes. and basically we're looking to actually take this beyond AIDS 2014. We believe this is a social impact study um, so people get an idea of some of the prejudices that people have suffered through living with HIV. Yeah, and it's just gonna be absolutely amazing and such a yeah. large world stage for this to actually be shown with so many people coming to Melbourne for it as mm. well. Of course, to put on a production of this size does take money at the end of the day. So <laughs> where can people go if uh, they want, they're really committed about helping you back this? Sure, statustheplay.com. Um, we'd certainly uh, welcome anybody that's interested in helping us back, back this and, and get it on the road. And it's not just a financial, you know, people that might be interested in helping with time and, and their energy and the enthusiasm. So we welcome, mm. we welcome anyone. Fantastic, guys. Thank you so much for spending thanks, some thanks, time thanks, with Sammy. me. It's just a pleasure to, to be around you. You inspire oh, me every thanks. single day and you're just amazing. <laughs> Thank you. You've been in the thick of it with Sammy, with the gorgeous Michelle and Stephen Barber on Bent TV. 
Now, if you'd like to help us at Bent TV, um, if you'd like to volunteer or become a series producer or a camera person, please, please contact us at www.benttv.org.au. We'd love to hear from you and we could really do with the support and the help. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.